28 Days Later is without a doubt one of my favorite horror movies of all time. It is, in fact, no questions asked, my favorite zombie for slash infected movie ever. The movie completely redefines the zombie genre by not only changing the origin of the zombies themselves, but also the way they interact with their environment. Granted, this is not the first movie to introduce fast zombies by any means, since that title can go to The Return of the Living Dead from 1985 or even Life Force from that same year, um, depending on how strict you are on the term zombie. In 28 Days Later, zombies are no longer this stupefied individual whose only purpose is to eat flesh and food, for some reason, move extremely slow, but rather this unstoppable human being who is seemingly never out of energy and completely powered by never settled anger. You know, when I was a kid and I watched old school zombie movies with my dad, I always wonder why is it that zombies would always manage to infect others, since they walk, not run, or even jogged, no, walk at an incredibly slow speed. Then one day, my dad decided to show me what he called one of the scariest and best zombie movies he had seen up to that day and proceeded to show me 28 days later. Needless to say, I was absolutely terrified, as I had never seen zombies that could not only catch up to me incredibly quickly and who seemed to be totally and utterly possessed, but also that has such a simple yet realistic origin to them. Now. I just want to make a small parenthesis here, I say realistic because to my 10 year old brain a zombie that came to be because of a sickness was just mind blowing. Explosion. It was like a cold, a very angry and bloodthirsty cold. And that's not good. Now I could sit here and talk about everything that made 28 Days Later so amazing and such a classic for hours, matter of fact. I really want to do that now, but that's not what this video is about. No, this video is about 28 weeks later, more specifically the intro sequence to that movie, a sequel by a different director that to be quite honest not everyone loved. While 28 Days Later was directed by Danny Boyle, 28 Weeks Later was directed by Juan Carlos Fresnadillo. Admittedly, sequels to horror movies have always had a pretty bad reputation. Usually what happens is that a horror movie will acquire mild to great success and then a sequel will be in the making in order to milk as much of that sweet sweet green that Hollywood never seems to have enough of. However, 28 weeks later did not do such a bad job, at least not in my opinion. Matter of fact, I dare say that 28 weeks later is miles away from many many horror movies that came after. Even then, I would never consider it to be as good as its predecessor. The movie has minor inconsistencies here and there, it introduces a few details about the infected that were not shown before, or at least not in detail, and a storyline that not every old fan of the franchise will be a fan of. Even as much as I love the movie now, I have to admit that when I first watched it, I got incredibly annoyed at Andy and her sister Tammy, as the action of these two kids ended up messing everything up again, possibly and well, very clearly to a greater scale, but even then it's not a big deal. Even in numbers, 28 weeks later used almost double the budget of 28 days and grossed around 20 million dollars less. However, and I'm willing to die on this hill, the intro sequence to 28 weeks later is amongst the scariest, most thrilling and memorable intros of any horror movie ever. And I say dying hypothetically. The scene begins with a couple in a very dark room, making dinner. It is clear by the interaction and even the volume of their voices that this is post-infection, and wherever they are, they have managed to survive and stay alive for quite some time now. We later find out that they have children, and although we don't know where they are, we can at least assume that they're not in England and thus more than likely safe. The scene moves on and now we know that there are more survivors with them, five at least, or at least five until one of them, Sam, the significant other of Karen, decided to run on them most likely trying to escape from the infected and England. The scene now introduces a possible source of conflict and one that can potentially not only affect Karen, but also the entire group. We now have an individual who is in constant state of desperation, and a desire to open the doors to anyone who is out there in the hopes of being her significant other, and it seems that everyone around her is aware of this. Suddenly, a knock on the door, not only the least suspected sound by everyone, but also the last thing that they all want to hear for the exception of Karen. 
a knock that soon discovered itself to be that of a young boy desperately screaming for help. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Alice's immediate response as soon as she knows that there's an actual person outside is to help. In fact, she rushes to the door as soon as she knows that it's a child asking for help. Dawn, on the other hand, has the opposite reaction, trying to find any possible reason not to open the door, and even when Alice tries to go and open the door, Dawn holds her down, making one last effort not to help anyone who's out there now knowing that it is a kid. Now, this might be a bit of a reach, but I saw this as a clear foreshadowing of the events to come. What I didn't know back then was just how fast those events will occur. When I first saw this scene happening in front of me, I thought, alright, so the action starts now. Kid goes in, and right after that, the infectors start breaking in, right? Well, no, not exactly. Or at least, not without what I consider is amazingly smart buildup. With the addition of the child, now you have two characters and very specific sources of stress and desperation. It is established early in the scene that Alice has this extreme uncertainty and sadness deep inside of not knowing anything about her children. Then, out of the sudden, a child is knocking on a door, and in a much deeper way, knocking on the door of her motherly senses. I believe that this is very much done on purpose, of course, as a kid could have been quite literally any other person, but a kid makes much more sense to set Alice in motion and try so desperately to help. And on the other hand, you have Karen, a woman whose significant other just went away and everyone is sure won't come back, everyone but her, who is constantly waiting for him. Karen has now witnessed what everyone in the house deem impossible. A survivor. And if this kid has managed to survive, then who is to say that her boyfriend is not out there and will come back too? This kid ultimately worked as the last push that Karen needed to expose herself and the group to the outside. Karen then goes to the window, and trying to be very careful, she takes off the racks between the wooden boards that are blocking the windows. Parentheses. Now, at this point of the scene, I know what is coming, you know what is coming, hell, even sad little Karen over here knows what is coming. However, instead of delivering an extremely aggressive and intensive break-in on behalf of the infected, the director decided to first let you see what you're about to face and more or less, the amount too. It is creepy as shit. This is where we get our very first glance to the well-known bloody red eyes of the infected. This is when we know. It is all over. The infected are now aware that there are people inside the farmhouse and proceed to come in through all fronts. Everything turns to madness from one second to another. Karen is dead. Joff, Margaret, and Jacob go to what seems to be the escape plan. Alice, while looking after the kid, tries to follow but is intercepted by more infected which prompts the kid to run upstairs and in an attempt to rescue him, Alice follows him. Her mother's senses kick in once again. Dawn sees this and desperately follows right after in an attempt to rescue Alice somehow. And here is where it gets interesting. Again. And may I just say, the acting in this scene is unbelievable. The screams of fear and agony coming from Karen, the fear in Dawn's face, even grandma's scream over here was so real and impactful I feel bad for her while at the same time just thinking, dude, what the hell were you thinking? Anyway, the reason why I feel these final moments of the scene are so important is because they seem to be the ones that prompt one of the main storylines of the movie, the constant and somehow conscious talking of Don towards his children. I call this Don's guilt. Very original, I know. Don runs desperately after Alice and locks the door after him, giving him just the exact time to escape together, but when he tries to get Alice, she refuses and goes after the kid on the other side of the room. Right as Alice is on the other side, the infected break in, setting up a barrier that Don is not willing to go through for the sake of his own life, regardless of the desperate screams for help coming from his wife. Don locks his door as his wife screams and looks at him in disbelief, and Alex makes one last desperate attempt to look for a way out. Don is able to get away through a window while Alice is not as lucky, only being able to scream the name of her husband as she sees him running away in fear. Don jumps to the boat and manages to escape taking one last glance at the window where once his wife was. It is unclear if Don forgot about that window out of fear and thus he believed that there was no way out on the other room, or if he was just a coward. But regardless, this puts on Don's shoulder a guilt that he is never able to get rid of and that his children for some reason don't seem to care about but really rather only make it worse. I say this is a setup for Don's storyline because it seems that these extreme guilt feelings were later turned into his extreme rage and the leading force that made him want to kill his family. 
the ones that made him feel that way all along. Coming from the first movie, the roles are completely flipped. In the first movie, the soldiers were the one with the ambiguous moral code and by the end of it were just straight up assholes, while the father figure was the moral cornerstone of the whole movie. In this movie, the father figure is the one with the ambiguous moral code and the soldier is the one that eventually becomes, you know, the moral centerpiece. At the end of the scene, Don gets away from the infected, but closer to his demons. Now, as I said before, there are some inconsistencies about the movie that I would like to address in a new segment that I would like to call... Wait, what? How is Alice still alive and well? In the movie, it shows that she's able to escape seemingly untouched with barely one bite mark. Yet, the farmhouse was infested and completely surrounded by the infected. Even if you wanted to make the argument that since she was immune, the infected would have leave her alone, it would make less sense. The first thing that Don does as soon as she is infected with the virus is completely beat her to death. Not even eat, just beat her. Yet somehow she's able to get away from the room full of them. I mean, what does she do? Does she end up using the little boy as a shield? Number 2. How are these two not only able to get into the country, but also just escape with no issues? Number 3. Jeremy Renner. Th that's it. Th that's the issue. Number four, and from now on, this segment is gonna turn into, wait, what? But petty. It is said at the beginning of the movie that Don has given an all access card, which, uh, I mean, sure, let's, let's just not have any issues with that, I guess. However, it is also shown at different points of the movie that cards need to be used in order to go in and out of a room. Don goes in to see Alice, the door locks behind him, he now needs to be able to use one of the cards to get out of the room, which of course he can't. How is he able to just get out and mess everything up again? The door is clearly locking behind him. I mean, excuse me for being unable to imagine one of these monstrosities slowly picking up a card and sliding it in a civilized manner. Number five, and this is maybe, this is, yeah, this is just me overthinking. How is Don able to retain such a high level of consciousness? He's literally able to find a perfect spot where he goes completely without damage from the firebombs that are show covering the entire godforsaken city. Able to completely control his anger multiple times throughout the movie until he is alone with the kids. And even if you want to make the argument that one of those times was a hallucination or something like that, it makes much less sense. Number 6. It is towards the end of the movie that the kids and the soldiers are able to find a car before getting killed by the gas or the infected. Now, at this point of the movie and the franchise, we've seen infected break through wooden boards, glass doors, locked military doors, apparently, and even a car back window in 28 days later. This car gets completely surrounded by infected, yet not one of them is able to break through the window. Because, of course. Number seven, done in the subway tunnels. Why is he in the sub? More importantly, how is he in the subway tunnels? Perfectly placed right next to the kids. Sure, you can say that he followed the horde that went into the tunnels earlier in the movie, but then where's everyone else? I watched this movie more times than I'm proud of admitting, but I can't understand this yet. And lastly, and this isn't even a, an inconsistency as much as it's just me thinking about this during my last run of the movie. Why does Tammy exist? I have nothing against her character, and her actress actually does a pretty good job, but I'm pretty sure that if you take her out of the movie at one point, or the entire movie, nothing really changes. Have Scarlet kill Dawn, or better yet, have Andy kill Dawn and make him reach the stadium by himself, and it's much more dramatic and terrifying. And even with all this, 28 weeks later is still, as I said before, miles away from all the other horror movies that came right after it. And well, that's going to be it for this video. I wanted to just take some time and thank all of you for taking the time to overthink this movie to the degree that I do. I kid you not, while I was writing the script for this video, I must have watched both movies around five times in the span of three days, but it was worth it, honestly. If you like this type of videos or the other type of videos I do or the gameplays or whatever I upload on this channel, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment if you want, Leave a question about the video or even the movie. I'm always willing to just talk about movies or whatever. And I'll see you all in the next one. Uh, thank you and bye-bye.